Okay, so today I will be giving the lecture about um, quantumness and quantum speedup in D waves devices. We still we had in the, pre in the past a lot of uh, talks about functioning uh, of quantum computers in general, but uh, the D wave devices are special in their way of functioning, and so I thought I will be focusing on them. Um, first, I will give a quick introduction into quantum mechanics for those of you who are the non-physicists, which will be, I think, most of you. Uh, after that, I will fix some criteria for a universal quantum computer and the circuit model, which is the model which you will, f which, which you will find nearly everywhere in uh, literature and uh, uh, nowadays studies. Um, after that, I will go uh, a bit more into the functioning of the D-Wave, which is not a universal quantum computer, but an adiabatic one. So I will talk about uh, optimization problems and the simulated annealing algorithm, which uh, most of you will know, as it is a classical algorithm, which perhaps uh, some of you have uh, uh, implemented uh, so far. And uh, I will go a bit more into the uh, physical functioning of uh, the D-Wave devices. And after that, I will come to the three studies uh, I want to present you, meaning um, one study from 2014, which is uh, about the quantumness of the D-Wave device, so whether um, the uh, coherence is still active for the D-Wave or not, because it has a lot of qubits, much more than uh, universal quantum computers are able to um, obtain now. And after that, I will uh, go into two studies about uh, quantum speedup, uh, one which uh, defines uh, the quantum speedup uh, uh, or gives a general definition what we can uh, expect by talking about quantum speedup and uh, a study about uh, from December 2015, where Google scientists uh, f uh, found some really high speed-up factors of 10 to the power of 8 compared to some classical algorithms. And in the end, I will also give uh, the conclusion. So, first of all, um, a small introduction to quantum mechanics. Most of you will know uh, the image with uh, Schrödinger's cat uh, with um, particles with, which are in two states uh, at the same time, etc., etc. Here I want to speak about it in a more um, mathematical term. So uh, physicists normally speak of a superposition of quantum states, meaning uh, you have um, you have a superposition of two basis states. So if you think a bit on linear algebra, which is a mathematical framework normally used for quantum mechanics, you will you can imagine a two-dimensional vector space with uh, the x-axis and the y-axis. For the x-axis, you can uh, you can you you can have a bijection to the state vector some people call zero. This one. And for the uh, y-axis, uh, you can identify it with uh, the state vector one here. The thing with quantum mechanics is, as long as there is no physical interaction with, this, with the actual system, the system, in this, in this uh, example, a two-state two system, but it can also be a free state system or a system in a vector space with uh, non-countable dimensionality. Um, you, uh, the, the system remains in a, the linear combination of these two states, meaning if you implement any operator, any linear operator on the system, so any function you can imagine, it will go to but it will act on both states. It will not act only on one or on the other state, but on both states. Um, and uh, when you measure the system, you will 
uh, project the state onto one of the base states. And the probability of obtaining one of the base states is given by the probability amplitude, here alpha and beta called, which are complex numbers, but uh, their uh, probability is given by the square. So um, that you have to get to get a really a real physical meaning of it, you have to um, implement a normalization on the vector space, me space, meaning that all probability amplitude square will add up to one. Because if not, uh, you would have uh, more than a likelihood of one for ever for all um, possible outcomes, which would uh, not be really would which would not really make sense in a physical way. So um, now when we look on a classic computer, we can ask what exactly is a classic computer. So the most basic thing one can imagine is, okay, we have two bits, zero and one, and we have uh, functions which we want to implement on these bits to uh, perform calculations on them, and uh, every of our functions function can be... Um, can be realized by the use of logic gates. And we can say, okay, we can have any logic gate, but how can we prove that we can implement any logic gate? Okay, we say, we have universal logic gates like NAND, with which we can build any other logic gate. So to prove that a system is a classical computer, we just have to make sure that the NAND gate can be implemented on every bit. So also we have a thing which is a very classical thing. So m most of our logic gates are non-reversible, like uh, the end gate. And now the question is, how can we implement this on a quantum computer, meaning a, a two-state system, which we have like n times? And the answer is quite easy, linear algebra. We have n of our two-state systems, which we call qubits. And our calculations are implemented by linear operators, which have to be unitary because our development or our calculation is the time evolution of a quantum system, which can only be uh, implemented through a unitary matrix. I can explain you afterwards why it is like that, but uh, it would be, it would go a bit deeper because for that you would have to integrate uh, Schrodinger's equation. <laughs> so our, ma our matrix must be unitary. This allows only for re reversible functions, meaning you have uh, to be able to redo them, to uh, invert the function. So we cannot implement the irreversible logic gates, only the re reversible ones. And now comes the great secret about universal quantum computing. The bits are in, the qubits are in the linear uh, combination of two states, meaning that our computation does not take place on one state or on another state, but so it does not take place on one bit or another bit, it takes place on all basis states of the basis we choose, we choose, meaning for one qubit we calculate on two-dimensional vector space. If we take two qubits, we have to couple every basis state to every other basis state meaning for two qubits we have four, but for three qubits we have eight basis states on which we calculate, meaning our vector space, our dimensionality does not increase linear, how it is the case for normal computers or normal computation, it increases exponential, meaning for n qubits we have two n to the, to the power of n basis states on which we can compute. So. This exactly gives uh, the computational power. Quantum computers are in the same complexity class as normal computers, meaning you cannot solve problems on a quantum computer, which you cannot solve on normal computer, 
but you can solve some problems, not all, but some, much faster. Which is the interest of quantum computing at all. So D-Wave works a bit different. D-Wave devices are adiabatic quantum computers, meaning they don't have uh, the logic gates as we know them. They have they they have a Hamiltonian, which is uh, implemented onto spins, which you can see here. And on this Hamiltonian, we can model an optimization problem, meaning that our device is only able to solve optimization problems, which still have a lot of applications in finance or also in computer sciences. And it solves this these optimization problems through quantum time evolution. Physical systems in general, so in chemistry, in physics, no matter where, mostly tend to the lowest energy state. They try to minimize their energy. This is also given by the Schrödinger equation, meaning your system will evolve due to this Hamiltonian and uh, will try to uh, try try to go to the global energy minimum so what, how, how can you use this you take your optimization problem which we want to solve you map it to to uh, this time depending hamiltonian you say at the beginning you take a simple problem uh, couple this thing, this Hamiltonian, to an external energy source here, which you uh, increase within time. And at the end, due to your adiabatic theorem, you say that the ground state of the simple problem will go to the ground state of the difficult problem which you want to solve. If your perturbation, so uh, your change of Hamiltonian, occurs sufficiently slowly. Um, so at the beginning of the computation, you say, okay, simple problem. Um, you increase um, the coupling to the energy source. And hopefully your system will, at the end of the computation, be found in the gra ground state, which you search for. And then you just have to identify this quantum ground state with the solution of your problem. The idea of, uh, of quantum annealing and simulated annealing can also be displayed. Uh, so we say we have an energy landscape like this, and we want to solve the, we want to try, find this uh, global minimum, but have the problem that sometimes we are trapped in this local minimum here. We have uh, two ways. So due to the coupling with the external energy source, the system within simulated annealing can sometimes cross this barrier by getting thermal energy from the uh, from the external bath, and then can go to this um, global energy state and will remain there. Problem is, you uh, for when your barrier is very high, you need to take a lot of energy, which is not so likely. It's a, a stochastic model. Quantum mechanics has an one advantage. With a certain likelihood, a quantum system can tunnel through an energy barrier. Or you can also formulate it in a different way. A certain part of your probability distribution will be found here. So you have a certain probability to tunnel through the barrier to be found in the ground state which can give you a significant uh, which can give you a speed up if uh, for the uh, classic problem the likelihood to make this thermal jump is quite low because the quantum system can use both it can use the thermal jump but also the tunneling effect okay so you can also ask yourself how can we realize it in a physical implementation, so what I talked about uh, was mostly the theory. Um, 
me myself, I prefer theory because it is universal. You can, you don't have to care how you realize it on the system. For D wave, um, you realize uh, the two states, zero and one, through the current flow in a superconducting ring. So one current flow like this corresponds to spin down or um, the one state, and the other one corresponds to the zero state. And um, you have you have couplings between the spins which are realized through uh, these bobines um, um, through, magnet through magnetic fields. And the external energy source is also represe represented by an external magnetic field. Um, you can then model your Hamiltonian, which you want to solve, on the system via a Linux interface. And uh, this allows you to change the interaction between the qubits as well as their individual weight. So if you want to have uh, one spin more important than another one, you set uh, the spin which is more important to hi equals one and the other one, for example, to ha equals 0 0.5 or stuff like that. You have, uh, so the, you have a structure which is called the chimera graph. You have uh, the you have always eight qubits in this basis cell, which are coupled to every other qubit, and then the qubits are also coupled uh, between each other, and you have the external magnetic field, which is also implemented on them. Yes, one small technical details. Um, you have uh, the D-Wave 1 with uh, 128 qubits and the D-Wave 2 with 100, 512 qubits, which is a record because in universal, uh, within the building of universal quantum computers, uh, the state of the art is about 5 to 10 qubits. So this number of qubits would give us if it were a universal quantum computer, a high computational power of 2 to the power of 128 or 2 to the power of 512, which uh, would give this machine more basis state, states to compute on than you have atoms in the universe. The only question is whether the quantum effects are still active. The problem is the more qubits you couple to each other, the more likely you have decoherence effects, meaning that the superposition or linear combination will be lost, meaning that your system will go to one of the base state and you cannot compute on that. So when we ask about quantumness of the D-Wave devices, we want to ask, are our qubits still uh, in the superposition or not? One thing you, you don't have to forget is that you have to cool down your system. This is too, uh, w this is nearly the absolute zero point. Absolute zero cannot be achieved due to the laws of thermodynamics, but this temperature is much cooler than the universe, and it is uh, the lowest temperature we can achieve at our time. So it's really state of the art. But you have to cool it to prevent the system from interacting with the, its environment to maintain the superposition. Okay. So the first study conducted in 2014 by Boixu et al. tried to find out whether the D-Wave machine is really quantum. The problem is you cannot open the computer and just look in to, to, the, in, to the inside because you would lose your superposition as this would uh, be also a measurement or an observation. So what can you do? You can say, okay, we implement random spin, pro spin, spin glass problems. So we just uh, choose randomly some Hamiltonians we calculate the correct solution or ground state on classical computers to, to know when we find the good result. And then we run 
a simulation of a quantum system, which is called simulated quantum annealing. We simulate classical spin dynamics and we use a classic algorithm, which is called simulated annealing, which also uses the method I described without the quantum tunneling. We look whether our computer, whether our simulations find uh, the ground state or not, calculate the probability and do the same for the D wave. And then we look up for the probability distribution, meaning, okay, has our quantum computer uh, the same probability distribution like a real quantum computer? Is it more behaving like simulated annealing? or could it behaving like classical spin dynamics? And so we can test whether our computer is quantum or not. Um, so you see, the D-Wave shows, shows a bi-model distribution, meaning you have uh, peaks here and peaks here. The same is true for the simulated quantum annealing and the spin dynamics. While the simulated annealing here shows an unimodal probability distribution, meaning it's uh, more linear. This B-model uh, probability distribution means you have a clear separation into hard and easy problems. Easy problems are those where the ground state is nearly always found, so with a probability of nearly one, which is here. And uh, the hard problems are those where the ground state is nearly never found, here, here and here. And you see that uh, the D-wave splits the problem nearly one-to-one -one in hard and easy problems, meaning you have nearly as much hard as uh, easy problems. The same is nearly true for simulated quantum annealing, where you have some more easy pr problems than hard problems. But it is not true for the spin dynamics, where you have a lot of hard problems here, but only a few easy problems here. Meaning that the D-wave will certainly not behave like the classical simulated annealing, and is also much less likely to behave like the spin dynamics, the classical spin dynamics, but uh, behaves very similar to the simulated quantum annealing here. Okay, but of course, this alone is not an indicator, so they also took the correlation between the methods and to prevent for calibration errors, which also occur. They took uh, the average, so uh, they made a lot of iteration, iteration, iterations of every problem and then took the average. And... Um, to have an auto-control parameter, they correlated the D-Wave device to itself, meaning this is the best uh, correlation distribution you can obtain. On uh, the red diagonal line, you have the points which uh, you would have for a perfect probability distribution. So it can be read like this. For example, SQA has one problem with uh, 0 0.6 uh, probability of obtaining the perfect solution. And for this problem, the D-Wave also has um, exactly the same probability here. But there is another problem, for example here, for which uh, SQA has a bit more than 0 0.6 probability but which uh, the D-Wave device is nearly completely able to solve. And, yeah, so uh, you can see here for the spin dynamics that you have a lot of problems which are hard for the classical spin dynamics here, which uh, are corresponding to these problems in the success probability distribution where the D-Wave device still has some chances of solving them and a section of problems which are easy for both methods, meaning that the D-Wave is in every way much more powerful than the classical spin dynamics. Compared to the simulated annealing, there are some problems for which uh, SA is much better. 
some problems for which both are equally uh, powerful, but the correlation is very weak because uh, the only points where, which are at least a bit correlated are these ones here. The, uh, the spin dynamics are nearly correlated at all. They show a very, very, very weak correlation. But for the simulated quantum annealing, the correlation is nearly as good as for the D-Wave device itself, meaning that our quantum mass in the D-Wave device is still preserved, even if we have a very high number of qubits. So the D-Wave will most likely behave like the simulated quantum annealing. Meaning we have a quantum computer, not a universal one, but an adiabatic one. The only question now is, is our quantum computer also fast? So can it solve optimization problems really better than a classical algorithm? Before I continue, what do you think? So um, what is your opinion on the theme? Do you think the D-Wave device has a possibility of being faster or not? So would you belong to the people who were investing more than $100 million into this startup? Yes or no? <laughs> Okay, so it's quite interesting because uh, the, lace, the, the latest point I heard from the scene was that, uh, yeah, D-Wave, you can't forget it, they uh, told a lot of bullshit, okay, um, they said we are fast, but they didn't show any results, etc., etc., which was also the point of uh, the 2014 study, 2013-2014, defining quantum speedup. Um, a group of uh, researchers, Renaud et uh, al, um, went together, they said, okay, what, how exactly do we define our quantum speedup? And uh, what do we test the D-Wave computer against? Okay, so they had like five categories, but which can be separated in roughly an either the provable quantum speedup meaning you can, it is mathematically provable that our algorithm is faster than any possible classic algorithm. You have, at the moment, two algorithms which are known for which it is the case. One algorithm is uh, Shor's algorithm for prime factoring, which is uh, the algorithm everybody talks about when quantum computers are said to break uh, ASR encryption which uses uh, the superposition and the quantum Fourier transformation. The other one is Groove search algorithm, which um, <coughs> uh, scales with the uh, root of the problem size and is much faster than any classical search algorithm and could also be used to break symmetric encryption. But both are not able to run on the wave device, sorry. <laughs> Okay, for our uh, quantum speedup for the D-Wave, we, we could only talk about so-called limited quantum speedup, meaning we have a quantum algorithm, meaning the quantum simulated annealing, or quantum annealing, and we search for a classical account path, part which uh, we ran against the D-Wave device. Here you have the problem you have to, to test all devices experiment experimentally, meaning you always have uh, errors within uh, experimentation, you have calibration errors, whatever, and uh, dependence on the experimental setup. Second problem is the chosen algorithm. Of course, we can say we have a lot of quantum speed up if we test, for example, our simulated quantum annealing against a monkey who's searching to take, or against a very weak classical algorithm. But in that case, it is not a, uh, not a quantum speedup. In that case, it is just a speedup of a fast algorithm against a slow algorithm, which we also don't want to. 
Okay, so in the study, um, they again chose a random spindle problems, tested it uh, on the D-Wave computer, and um, the simulated annealing as it is very near to the functioning of the D-Wave device. And the simulated quantum annealing, I don't think I have to say uh, a lot of things on it. It's also mostly behaving like the D-Wave device, so they chose the algorithms quite well but still didn't really found a real quantum speed up. They said, okay, we have an indice for limited quantum speed up in a certain category, a subcategory of problem size, but mm, we are not very sure. But they also stated some problems, meaning they tested the D-Wave device without any error correction. And the problem for adiabatic quantum computing is that with all the spins you have in the device, you need very good error correction. So quantum adiabatic quantum computing can be universal, but only when you have no noise at all. And even at 0.2 Kelvin, you still have some noise, meaning you need some very good error correction to get a better performance. Second problem is hidden parallelization within the simulated annealing, and you can mistake this parallelization for a quantum speedup. It is clear when you distribute one problem onto two processes, it will be faster than the same problem on only one processor. It's clear, but that wouldn't be any quantum speedup. It would just be parallelization. And the third thing is the calibration errors. It's an experimental setup, meaning you always have some errors within. And it is this study, which is uh, cited by, I think, nearly everybody in the scene as well as in sciences, when people say, okay, D-Wave is a lot of uh, expensive trash. It is failing its goals. We can forget it which was also the last um, information I had on the theme, but in December 2015, I found a paper from Google, a study from Google, which was cited, meaning that D-Wave could be quite fast for some problems. And it is uh, this study which uh, woke my interest on this theme. So, um, some researchers, uh, Dennis, Dennis uh, Boixu et al., uh, compared um, the newest D-Wave device, the D-Wave 2X, again against simulated annealing, but also against another algorithm which is mostly used in high finance, which is called Quantum Monte Carlo. It's also a cl classical algorithm, even if it has quantum in its name. But is, uh, it is one of the best algorithms we know at our time. And they wanted to know, okay, we have a wall clock time, which is the time we need uh, to program the device, to read out, and to have the annealing. But for a theoretical speedup, we are only interested in the pure annealing time, meaning the time we take for the calculation in the device. We don't care how long it takes us to program the device, how long it takes us to read it, etc. We are only interested in this annealing time to show how fast we can be. And it's clear, if we have a short annealing time, we have a fast calculation and result, meaning the shorter the annealing time, the faster the device. And the annealing time is also linear in speed up, meaning when we talk about speed up, we can as well talk about the annealing time. Yeah. So, the results. They found a very high speed up factor within the range of 10 to the power of 8 against the simulated annealing and against quantum Monte Carlo. Meaning, the D wave device is more than 100 million times faster than the classical algorithms. They explain it with the tunnel effect. Um, as I even said, um, 
a quantum particle can tunnel through an energy barrier where simulated annealing has to jump over the energy, energy barrier, which we will also see later in the annealing time, how it is, um, how it is calculated, etc. And this also shows here, so for simulated annealing, you have the asymptotic speed up, meaning the higher your problem size, the faster the D-Wave device is against uh, the simulated annealing. For quantum Monte Carlo, we only have a constant factor speed up, meaning the D-Wave will always be by constant factor times faster than quantum Monte Carlo. But still, in both cases, the speed up is quite high. So we can calculate uh, the quantum annealing time when we look at the number of co-tunneling qubits here. It is exponential in this number, and we have uh, some prefactors BQA and alpha, which are determinate, determinated by the system. For the simulated annealing, the annealing time is also exponential within the energy, the temperature, and Boltzmann, Boltzmann's constant, constant, meaning the higher the energy, the, the energy, the longer the process takes. But if our barrier is very tall, so very, very, very tall and very narrow, so quite high and quite small, the advantage of the tunnel effect is very high, meaning when the barrier is very thin, the particles, are, the quantum particles are much, much more able to uh, have a higher probability of tunneling through the barrier, and then the barrier is very hall, uh, tall, uh, so uh, very great. The probability of having uh, enough energy for the thermal jump to cross the barrier is quite low, meaning in this case the annealing time up to the ground state takes much, much longer than the annealing time for the D-Wave device. And as the exponential function increases faster than any polynome, the constant factor is for n uh, to infinity not really important, meaning only the exponential part is important. And so you have this uh, asymptotic speed up, meaning the more uh, parameters you have in your problem, the faster the D-Wave device will be compared to the simulated annealing. For quantum Monte Carlo, it looks a bit different as quantum Monte Carlo also uses the tunnel effect, even if it is a classical algorithm, it is a classical simulation. The coefficient here is equal because uh, the quantum Monte Carlo also uses the tunnel effect, but still as the D-Wave device is a physical system using real physics to, uh, for its calculation, the prefactor here is much uh, much smaller than uh, the prefactor here, meaning that the quantum annealing time of the D-Wave device is still much shorter than the annealing time of quantum Monte Carlo. But uh, the speed up is only by this constant factor, meaning by BQA divided by uh, BQMC. Yes, um, you can also see it uh, in this graph. You, hear, you have uh, approximately the same slope for D-Wave and quantum Monte Carlo. It is a logarith logarithmic scale, meaning the slope is equal to the exponent, to this exponent here. This slope <coughs> is um, equal to um, this exponent here. And here you can see that um, D-Wave and quantum Monte Carlo have the same slope as even said, but they have uh, this different factor within the uh, annealing time, meaning that even for an increasing problem size, the D-Wave is uh, fa faster by the same amount. 
while compared to SA, the D wave gets faster, faster, faster. So here you have to look at the difference between the simulated annealing and the, and, uh, the D wave. This difference becomes uh, greater the, the higher the problem size is in bits, meaning that the D wave will always be much faster than the simulated annealing. And it is mostly very, a very high problem size for which you want to use this quantum computer. Yes, so to my conclusion, um, the D-Wave is, as even said, adiabatic, and it is not universal. Adiabatic is equal to universal only without any noise, meaning as long as we don't have good error correction codes, we cannot implement Shaw's algorithm on the D-Wave device. We can only solve the optimization problems, but it is still quite useful for a very great range of problems. We have uh, the B-model distribution and the good correlation for both the D-wave and uh, the simulated annealing, meaning that the D-wave will use some quantum effects, meaning simulated quantum annealing in its uh, calculations. For the speed-up, we can say that um, the quantum tunneling effect allows for a very significant speed-up for the computational problems by the factor of 1 to the power of 8 but it is very depending on the algorithm, meaning for the uh, SA we have the asymptotic speedup, for the quantum Monte Carlo the constant factor speedup, but for some algorithms we have no speedup at all. So there are algorithms for which a normal laptop is 15 times faster than the wave, which could be a problem at the time. But we also have to say that quantum computers are not faster than normal computers in every case. They are faster for some problems. Meaning it is dependent on your problem which device you want to choose. And um, for the algorithms which are always cited, for which we do need a quantum computer, the D-Wave is not able to have them implemented on it because still we lack the error correction. Okay. So here are my sources. Um, the studies are quoted. They are also in the wiki with their, with a link to them. So you can, uh, so you can read for yourself how the scientists, uh, concluded their studies, their results, etc. And now I'm open for any questions if you have some. <laughs> Yeah? Okay. So um, your question was which algorithms we can expect to run on this machine? Yes. Every optimization problem you can Uh, so every optimization problem you can map to the Hamiltonian. You can, uh, so uh, the Hamiltonian is equivalent to nearly every optimization problem you can imagine, so you can map every optimization problem on it. The only question is uh, you have to find a mapping, so you have to find a bijection between the Hamiltonian and your optimization problem saying, okay, this, this spin is equal to this, this variable uh, and my couplings and my weights are equal to uh, its coefficients. So you have to imagine for yourself which problem you have and how you want to map it on the D-wave on the Hamiltonian. Other questions? Uh, will we find such a cooking book for the mapping? 
So by the time that you that don't have to invest so much time to find this mapping? Okay, there I would have to talk to researchers. So I'm just a physics bachelor student who was interested in the theme and wrote a homework on, on it. But um, some of the researchers you can talk to over the internet um, on RVIX where I found the studies. Uh, you have the email addresses. Also, one math, uh, one mathematician who were the one writing the algorithm, which is 15 times faster on a laptop than the D-Wave device, uh, put his code online uh, on GitHub. Um, I could give you the link if you want. So I think uh, you would have to talk to the mathematicians and But I, I'm sure, so as it is proven that you can map every problem onto this device, there should also be a cookbook for it. Um, it's just there I would really have to talk to the people. But it's an in interesting question and I'm really thinking whether I should do so or not. Um, of course, I think um, they have email addresses. I think you can just write that you're interested in such a thing that you heard a talk on the studies and my interest was also to make these studies a bit more public because on AVIX uh, uh, one is able to see all the blog blogs which are linking to it, all the studies who are referencing to it and these are studies which are quite important I think but uh, which no one pays attention to so I think there were just an, a few number of blog posts who are, were linking to it and so so I think you should be able to um, just write them a mail and get an answer. Hmm? You're welcome. Um, I seem to remember that there is a contract for D-Wave orderings, basically, that states that I think every two years you get twice the capacity in quantum bits. So how do they achieve this? Is this something that's trivial and can be scaled, I don't know, for the next 50 years? Or is this something that is limited rather soon and they will not be able to make much progress anymore? Mm, honestly, concerning that, I have no idea. So you cannot look within the D-Wave. You are... When you buy this computer for $10 million, dollars, you are forbidden to open it and look within. It's the second, it's, uh, the second reason why uh, the researchers conducted this study, whether it is quantum or not. D-Wave promises a lot, but as we don't really can look on the inside and find out what is within there, we cannot say whether the number of qubits are doubling every year or not, whether it is even possible or not. So the thing is, we have researchers from everywhere in the world who are working with enormous budgets on getting quantum computers to run, which are at 10 qubits maximum. So the record for, for example, Shaw's algorithm was in 2002 that they factored 15 into its prime factors three and five. Um, <laughs> this is the problem, so... Oh, nice! So, the problem with quantum computers in general is not that the theory is not clear, it's uh, the experimental physics, which are just quite weak. Th but I can tell you that uh, the critics of D-Wave say they use the wrong approach. They say the whole design has some difficulties, and said they should not be go into adiabatic quantum computing, but should go more into universal quantum computing. Uh, the third thing is there exists a third concept for quantum computers, which is uh, the measurement-based quantum computation, meaning that you use measurements to drive the computation forwards. And there you could have an approach which allows for universal quantum computing, but which, as far as I know, can also or could perhaps be in the future implemented on D-Wave devices. I don't know whether anybody has ever thought on that. Really, I don't know. <laughs> But it could be perhaps a way of getting this into work. Uh, yes? So it's a second terminal law and it's also uh, for information processing. So you need uh, for uh, 
calculation uh, minimum amount of energy. So I think it's independent uh, if I use CMOS or quantum computing or something else. So it's a minimum energy uh, used for calculation. And uh, so is it, will quantum computing be uh, somewhere in the future uh, is a better choice for some algorithms or uh, is it possible that CMOS will be uh, some years later do everything and we don't need quantum computing? Uh, okay, so for this one I have to admit I never heard of CMOS. I uh, it's a really normal computer. Okay. Electronic ah, okay. So um, I don't. Uh, I'm not sure. So concerning the energy, I think you are referring to the equivalence of uh, energy, entropy, and information. Yes, uh, so the signal to noise ratio, and oh. you have the thermal noise mm -hmm. and the signal energy for the computation. Mm -hmm. And so you can say you have an electronic computer mm -hmm. and have a lower signal level. And so you can have lower energy consumption, but there is a minimum because uh, there will be more errors in computation when okay. the signal level is near to the noise level. So really, I cannot answer this. I would, uh, from just an intuitive point, think that uh, as your um, as your calculations on a universal quantum computer, not this adiabatic one, but on the universal one, are just uh, always different basis choices. So you so you always choose different bases for uh, a two times two subspace or for the your tensor product space. It doesn't matter. So you always just choose bases and project onto basis states. That uh, the choice of bases is not an inherent choice of your vector space. It's something you do for yourself. So I would say that you perhaps lose, not lose entropy, that you take, that the only energy you are taking within the computation is the readout. It's just something intuitive, I would say. I really don't know it. But I would say that it doesn't matter how many computations you do on the thing, as the unitary matrices you have there, which you use for the computation, are just, uh, so on the one hand, they are just uh, their rotations within, ti within the time. Second thing is they are operators you use for the quantum time evolution process, so for the natural evolution of your quantum system. You would have them in any case. So I think the only, and the third thing is that uh, no matter how many of these matrices you're multiplicating, so how many functions you're mapping together, when you have a function which projects to one qubit on another qubit, you always have the same, you can always uh, represent it within one rotation or one matrix. Meaning, I think on the computation itself, you don't lose the entropy or gain entropy. I think it's only on the readout process. But for the measurement based quantum computation, there you would, uh, if this idea were as I say it, right? There you would uh, constantly lose energy. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Is it fine?